wonderfully good. The mail has come, and almost every man has a few letters and papers. We stroll over to the meadow behind the billets. Crop has the round lid of a margarine tub under his arm. On the right side of the meadow, a large common latrine has been built, a roofed and durable construction. But that is for recruits who as yet have not learned how to make the most of whatever comes their way. We want something better. Scattered about everywhere, there are separate individual boxes for the same purpose. They are, the, they are square, neat boxes with wooden sides all around and have imp unimpeachably satisfactory seats. On the sides are hand grips, enabling one to shift them about. We move three together in a ring and sit down comfortably, and it will be two hours before we get up again. I well remember how embarrassed we were as a recruits in, in the barracks when we had to use the general latrine. There were no doors and 20 men side by side as in a rail railway carriage so that they could be reviewed all at one glance, for soldiers must always be under supervision. Since then we have learned better than to sh be shy about such trifling immodesties. In time, far worse things than that came easy to us. Here in the open air, the business is entirely a pleasure. I no longer understand why we should always have shied away, at, shied at these things before. They are, in fact, just as natural as eating and drinking. We might perhaps have paid no particular attention to them had they not figured so large in our experience, nor been such novelties to our minds. To the old hands, they had long been a mere matter of course. The soldier is on friendlier terms than other men with his stomach and intestines. Three quarters of his vocabulary is derived from these regions, and they give an intimate flavor to expressions of his greatest joy as well as of his deepest indignation. It is impossible to express oneself in any other way so clearly and pithily. Our families and our teachers will be shocked when we go home, but here it is the universal language. Enforced publicity has, in our eyes, restored the character of complete innocence to all these things. More than that, they are so much a matter of course that their comfortable performance is fully as much enjoyed as the playing of a safe, top-running flush. Top running flush. Not for nothing was the word latrine rumor invented. These places are the regimental gossip shop and common rooms. We feel ourselves, for the time being, better off than in any palatial, white-tiled, quote, convenience. There, it can only be hygienic. Here, it is beautiful. These are wonderfully carefree hours. Over us is the blue sky. On the horizon float the bright, yellow, sunlit observation balloons. And the many little white clouds of the anti-aircraft shells. Often they rise in a sheaf as they follow after an airman. We hear the muffled rumble of the front, only as very distant thunder, bumblebees droning by quiet, by quite drowning. Around us stretches the flowery meadow. The grasses sway their tall spears. The white butterflies flutter around and float on the soft, warm wind of the, la of the late summer. We read letters and newspapers and smoke. We take off our caps and lay them down beside us. The wind plays with our hair. It plays with our words and thoughts. The three boxes stand in the midst of the glowing red field poppies. We set the lid of the margarine tub on our knees, and so we have a good table for a game of scat. Crop has the cards with him. After every misère au verte, we have a round of nap. One could sit like this forever. The notes of an accordion float across from the from the billets. Often we lay the car, lay aside the cards and look about us. One of us will say, well, boys, or it was a near thing that time, and for a moment we fall silent. There is in each of us a feeling of constraint. We are all sensible of it. It needs no words to communicate it. It might easily have happened that we should not be sitting here on our boxes today. It came damn near to that. And so everything is new and brave. Red poppies and good, for, and good food, cigarettes and summer breeze. Crop asks, anyone seen Kemmerich lately? He's up at St. Joseph's, I tell him. Mueller explains that he has a flesh wound in his thigh, a good blighty. 
We decide to go and see him this afternoon. Krop pulls out a letter. Kantarik sends you all his best wishes. We laugh. I w Mueller throws his cigarette away and says, I wish he was here. Kantarik had been our schoolmaster, a stern little man in a gray tailcoat with a face like a shrewd mouse. He was about the same size as Corporal Himmelstoss, the terror of Klosterberg. It is very queer that the unhappiness of the world is so often brought on by small men. They are so much more energetic and uncompromising than the big fellows. I have always taken care to keep out of sections with small company commanders. They are mostly confounded little martinets. During drill time, Canterick gave us long lectures until the whole of our class went, under his shepherding, to the district commandment and volunteered. I can see, I can see him now as he used to glare at us through his spectacles and say in a moving voice, Won't you join up, comrades? These teachers always carry their feelings ready in their waistcoat pockets and trot them out by the hour, but we didn't think of that then. There was indeed one of us who hesitated and did not want to fall into line. That was Joseph Bem, a plump, homely fellow, but he did allow himself to be persuaded. Otherwise, he would have been ostracized, and perhaps more of us thought as he did, but no one could very well stand out, because at that time even one's parents were ready with the word coward. No one had the vaguest idea what we were in for. The wisest were just the poor and simple people. They knew the war to be a misfortune, whereas those who were better off and should have been able to see more clearly what the consequences would be, were beside themselves with joy. Kaczynski said that the, that was the result of their upbringing. It made them stupid. And what Kat said, he had thought about. Strange to say, Ben was one of the first to fall. He got hit in the eye during an attack, and we left him, lying for dead. We couldn't bring him with us because we had to come back helter-skelter. In the afternoon, suddenly we heard him call and saw him crawling about in no man's land. He had only been knocked unconscious. Because he could not see and was mad with pain, he failed to keep under cover and so was shot down before anyone could go and fetch him in. Naturally, we couldn't blame Canterick for this. Where would the world be if one brought every man to book? There were thousands of Canterics, all of whom were convinced that they were acting for the best in a way that cost them nothing. And that is why they let us down so badly. For us lads of 18, they ought to have been mediators and guides to the world of maturity, the world of work, of duty, of culture, of progress, to the future. We often made fun of them and played jokes on them, but in our hearts we trusted them. The idea of authority which they represented was associated in our minds with a greater insight and a more humane wisdom. But the first death we saw shattered this belief. We had to recognize that our generation was more to be trusted than theirs. They surpassed us only in phrases and in cleverness. The first bombardment showed us our mistake, and under it the world as they had taught us broke in pieces. While they continued to write and talk, we saw the wounded and dying. While they taught that duty to one's country is the greatest thing, we already knew that death throes are stronger. But for all that, we were no mutineers, no deserters, no cowards. They were very free with all these expressions. We loved our country as much as they. We went courageously into every action, but also... We distinguished the false from true. We had suddenly learned to see, and we saw that there was nothing of their world left. We were all at once terribly alone, and alone we must see it through. Before going over to see Kantrip pack up, see Kimmerick, we pack up his things. He will need them on the way back. In the dressing station, there is great activity. It reeks as ever of carbolic, pus, and sweat. We are accustomed to a good deal. 
in the billet. But this makes us feel faint. We ask for Kemerick. He lies in a large room and receives us with feeble expressions of joy and helpless agitation. While he was unconscious, someone had stolen his watch. Mueller shakes his head. I always told you that nobody should carry as good a watch as that. Mueller is rather crude and tactless. Otherwise, he would hold his tongue, for anyone can see that Kemmerich will never come out of this place again. Whether he finds his watch or not will make no difference. At the most, one will only be able to send it to his people. How goes it, Franz? asked Krop. Kemmerich's head sinks. Not so bad, but I have such a damn pain in my foot. We look at his bed covering. His leg lies under a wire basket. The bed covering arches over it. I kick Mueller on the shin, for he is just about to tell Kemmerich what the orderlies told us outside that Kimmerich has lost his foot. The leg is amputated. He looks ghastly, yellow, and wan. In his face, there are already the strained lines that we know so well. We have seen them now hundreds of times. They are not so much lines as marks. Under the skin, the life no longer pulses. It has already been pressed out the boundaries of the body. Death is working through from within. It is already has command in his eyes. Here lies our comrade, Kemrick, who a little while ago was roasting horse flesh with us and squatting in the shell holes. He, he it is still, and yet it is not he any longer. His features have become uncertain and faint, like a photographic plate from which two pictures have been taken. Even his voice sounds like ashes. I think of the time we went when we went away. His mother, a good plump matron, brought him to the station. She wept continually. Her face was bloated and swollen. Kemrick felt embarrassed, for she was the least composed of all. She simply dissolved into fat and water. Then she caught sight of me and took hold of my arm again and again and implored me to look after Franz out there. Indeed, he did have a, f he did have a face like a child and such frail bones that after four weeks pack-carrying, he already had flat feet. But how can a man look after anyone in the field? Now you will soon be going home, he sa says Crop. You would have had to wait at least three or four months for your leave. Kemrick nods. I cannot bear to look at his hands. They are like wax. Under the nails is the dirt of the trenches. It shows through blue-black like poison. It strikes me that these nails will continue to grow like lean, fantastic cellar plants long after Kemrick breathes no more. I see the picture before me. They twist themselves into corkscrews and grow and grow, and with them the hair on the decaying skull, just like grass and good soil. And just like grass, how can it be possible? Mueller leans over. We brought your things, Franz. Kemrick signs with his hands. Put them under the bed. Mueller does so. Kimmerich starts on again about the watch. How can one calm him without making him suspicious? Mueller reappears with a pair of airman's boots. They are fine English boots of soft yellow leather, which reach to the knees and lace up all the way. They are things to be coveted. Mueller is delighted at the sight of them. He matches their, soul against, their soles against his own clumsy boots and says, Will you be taking them with you then, Franz? We all three have the same thought. Even if he should get better, he would be he would able. Even if he should get better, he would be able to use only one. They are of no use to him. But as things are now, it is a pity that they should stay here. The orderlies will, of course, grab them as soon as he is dead. Won't you leave them with us? Mueller repeats. Kemrick doesn't want to. They are, they are his most prized possessions. Well, we could exchange, suggests Mueller. Out here, one can make some use of them. Still, Kemrick is not to be moved. I tread on Mueller's foot. Reluctantly, he puts the fine boots back again under the bed. We talk a little more and then take our leave. Cheerio, Franz. I promised him to come back in the morning. Mueller talks of doing so, too. He is thinking of the lace-up boots 
and means to be on the spot. Kemrick groans. He is feverish. We get hold of an orderly outside and ask him to give Kemrick a dose of morphia. He refuses. If we were to give morphia to everyone, we should have to have tubs full. You only attend, uh, you only attend to officers properly, says Krupp viciously. I hastily intervene and give him a cigarette. He takes it. Are you usually allowed to give it then? I asked him. He is annoyed. If you don't think so, then why do you ask? I press a few more cigarettes into his hand. Do us the favor. Well, all right, he says. Crop goes in with him. He doesn't trust him and wants to see. We wait outside. Mueller returns to the subject of the boots. They would fit me perfectly. In these boots, I get blister after blister. Do you think he will last till tomorrow after drill? If he passes out in the night, we know where the boots. Crop returns. Do you think, he asks, done for? says Mueller emphatically. We go back to the huts. I think of the letter that I must write tomorrow to Kemmerich's mother. I am freezing. I could do with a lot a tot of rum. Mueller pulls up some grass and chews it. Suddenly, little Crop throws his cigarette away, stamps on it savagely, and looking around him with a broken and distracted face, stammers, Damn shit! The damn shit! We walk on for a long time. Crop has calmed himself. We understand. He saw red. Out there, every man gets like that sometimes. What has Canterick written to you? Mueller asks him. He laughs. We are the Iron Youth. We all three smile bitterly. Crop rails. He is glad that he can speak. Yes, that's the way they think. These hundred thousand Canterics. Iron Youth. Youth. We are none of us more than 20 years old, but young, youth, that is long ago. We are old folk.